I'm sorry. <laughs> First thing that goes is your hearing. Hopefully my memory will go next and I won't remember what I just did. The Lord, <laughs> the Lord knew my heart in the prayer, so it's all good. That's all. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're good. Right. I didn't catch it either. You didn't catch it either? <laughs> I didn't know what's going on. <laughs> so, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Moving on with our series. It's kind of cool in here. Is anybody else cool besides me? It's real nice in here. Yeah? Can, uh, Brother Young, can you do something to make that thing blow some hot air for a few minutes? Just to cut the chill. It should be okay after about 10 minutes or so, but for now it's kind of chilly. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. That's our next section on uh, New, Test New Testament prophecy. And it says this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'll start reading in verse 7, it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day. So you read through these verses and the first thing you notice is that the majority of this passage uh, seems to point more toward the, the fate, the future fate of the lost. And uh, when you read it, it begins with the Lord being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And when you consider these verses, uh, at first glance, uh, it can be a bit difficult to determine whether this is the rapture or the second advent. But uh, the reason why is because both comings are accompanied with angels. And when we consider the outcome of this coming, uh, then it starts to become a bit more apparent. Because in the rapture, the saints are taken away from the earth and the tribulation begins. Um, you know, when, when that happens, uh, God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. But we don't find uh, hellfire judgment uh, you know, immediately preceding the rapture. So if what we're reading in these verses speaks of a hellfire judgment immediately preceding the coming, uh, then that would not be the rapture. Um, in that case, then it's referring to the second advent, right? Anybody there? Hello? Anybody out there? Okay. So uh, after the second advent, and to be more accurate, as soon as the second advent happens, the Lord comes and immediately after that, there is a judgment, which is described to us in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. It's called the judgment of the nations. We'll read a portion of that in a moment. But uh, you've probably read that before, that during that judgment, what happens? God separates the sheep from the goats. And the sheep enter into the kingdom, into life eternal. Uh, the goats, however, doesn't fare off so well for them. Uh, they're cast into hell. So in Matthew 25, 46, where this section ends, it says, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So uh, let me kind of set the, uh, the prophetic calendar for you again. You've got, the, you've got the rapture. The Lord comes in the clouds. He calls his children home, uh, and we go to be with him for uh, seven years. We're not on the earth. And during that time on the earth, during the tribulation period, bad things. Bad, I always thought it was kind of funny, it's seven years, because in America we have a superstition uh, that if someone breaks a mirror, what is it? Seven years bad luck. Yeah, seven years bad luck. I wonder if there's any connection there. Right? Now, I don't believe that, obviously, but uh, there, there is that uh, to be said. So uh, after the seven years of terrible things happening, then the second advent. During the second advent, the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, and when he returns to the earth, he establishes his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And then after that, there's the, another uh, judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment, and then the, uh, the eternal state. Now, you can read all about that uh, starting in Revelation 19, 20, 21, 22. And so the outline is laid out for us there uh, very clearly. Um, there's another passage in Zechariah which explains um, a bit more clearly than what we read in, in 2 Thessalonians. Um, if it's not more clear, at least it's a little more concentrated. So 
If you turn there to Zechariah chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 5, and we'll just read through that. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And I'll give you all a moment to find that because Zechariah is one of those little bitty books that's hard to find for some folks. Manasseh is there, amen. He found it quickly. All right? And the electronic guys, they're all there already, you know. All right, so I think we're all there. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So first of all, um, there are several different positions on Bible prophecy. Um, one of the positions which uh, is, to me, bothersome is the idea of taking uh, Bible prophecy and explaining it away by saying, well, that already all happened, and they were just uh, they were just writing about it, or maybe they wrote it as prophecy, and it's already happened, and now there's nothing coming for us. Um, but if you notice in verse four, it talks about the Mount of Olives being split in half, and half of the mountain moves toward the north, and half of the mountain moves toward the south. That's never happened. So uh, if you hold whatever doctrinal position you hold on prophecy, you you've got to explain all these details. You can't just gloss, gloss it over and say, well, I don't know how that fits my, my theory. Um, you can't do that, especially when something is so clear. And I suppose you could try to spiritualize it and say, well, you know, it just means the people or, or something like that. But literally, if you take it literal, this has never happened. So what we're looking at here in Zechariah 14 verses 1 through 5 has never occurred yet. This is to be taken in one complete section. Uh, verses 1 and 2 speak of the armies, uh, the armies of the Antichrist, which initially will surround Jerusalem in order to bring destruction. Uh, but as this happens, the Lord returns in the second advent, and he brings destruction on them instead. Uh, we often refer to this as the uh, great battle of Armageddon. Have you, you know, you saw the movie Armageddon, right? Everybody saw the movie Armageddon? No. No? It was before your time? <laughs> uh, I, I don't really remember. I think it had something to do with space, though. Is that right? Going to space or going to Mars or an asteroid or something. Anyway, that's not it, okay? When you read the Bible, that's not it. Armageddon is a, is a, is a big battle that's going to happen in a valley called the Valley of Megiddo. And so you can hear the relationship between Megiddo and Armageddon, right, uh, based on the same words. And uh, at that point, the Lord is going to win the battle against the enemies of God's people and against his enemies. And so that is the second advent. He returns, he stands upon the Mount of Olives, it cleaves in half, and he slays the enemy, all right? Now, the Greek word that is translated as reveal is the word apocalypsis. And that's what we saw back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, let me get the exact verse for you here, so in case you forgot, uh, verse verse 7, okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, and so you find the word apocalypsis there, translated reveal, and it denotes something being uncovered, as in the removing of a veil from something. Um, this particular word is found 18 times in the New Testament, and it's used in a lot of different ways, okay, it can mean to, to lighten something, to bring light to something, or uh, it's translated revelation in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, reveal, like we saw in our passage here, or coming, uh, or appearing. So you get the idea of the word there. Something that has been either unknown or unseen has now occurred. It's not something that is completely unknown, 
It is something that has been shaded as in a veil. So maybe we know a little bit, but we don't really see everything, but now we see everything. So in this case, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, apocalypsis is emphasizing the physical manifestation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that the world has never seen. Now we're talking about it now. So obviously, you know, we, we've got some detail, but it's like seeing through a veil. I remember when I was a kid, um, when my parents would sometimes tell us to, you know, go to bed or whatever, um, we, would, we would try to uh, watch the TV and then we had a, a curtain, with a, my, my mom had hung a curtain between the, the door that goes into the living room and the, you know, the rest of the house, you know, it was kind of, there was no door there, so she put a curtain there, you know, kind of an old-fashioned door. And so we would stand back so we couldn't see, they couldn't see our feet and watch the TV through the veil and you couldn't really see much. You kind of had to listen and kind of see vague images, but you couldn't see detail. When the Lord comes, all the detail will be revealed and we'll see him as we've never seen him before, manifest in his glory as the King of Kings. Now go to Daniel chapter 7 because we find a similar imagery in the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So again, we have in Daniel a description of the coming of the Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days and he is brought before the Ancient of Days. So let me kind of help you with this. The Ancient of Days is God, God the Father. Uh, the Son of Man being the Lord Jesus Christ is now awarded the kingdoms by God the Father. So that's what we have described here for us. The Son of Man receives the kingdom. Yes, sir? Is there any uh, significance in the fact that that's repeated all throughout Daniel? What, the, the phrase Son of Man, or? Uh, like his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, like when Nebuchadnezzar was a... Okay, so the kingdom. Let's talk about the kingdom real quick, okay? Um, is there a kingdom of God right now? Yes. Yes. Can we see it? No. No. Uh, the New Testament describes the kingdom of God as being existent right now, but the kingdom is within you. All right? Uh, it's a spiritual thing. It is not meat and drink, as it says in the New Testament. However, that is the spiritual aspect of the kingdom that exists now. There is a physical aspect to the kingdom as well. That has not uh, started, at least not here on planet Earth, okay? In heaven, of course, but here, no, not so much. Look around you. If this is the kingdom of God, there's some dark days coming, okay? Uh, this is not it. But when the Lord returns, and I'm not talking about the rapture now, I'm talking about the second advent, he's going to establish a millennial kingdom. Again, Revelation chapter 20. From that point on, um, it is everlasting as a physical kingdom. It's everlasting now as a spiritual kingdom. But what Daniel is describing is the physical aspect of a kingdom on earth. The whole dream of the, the statue. We talked about this a little bit Friday, Friday night. The statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreams about. Uh, it comes to an end. The kingdoms of man are destroyed by the kingdom of God. A physical, literal kingdom upon the earth. All right? So... Uh, anyway, moving on. So as he comes, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Lord brings the fierceness of God's vengeance upon the unrighteous, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It goes on to say that they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 mentions that the rest will come, I think that's a typo, it should be first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, I hate when I make mistakes. I am so imperfect. Anyway, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, let me change my notes here real quick, because otherwise I'll forget to do that, and it'll be a mess later. 
One. Okay. So, Second uh, Thessalonians chapter one seven mentions arrest, arrest that will come for the believer, arrest for those who trouble them. Now, the tribulation. Um, let me back up and say this. So the rapture happens. We're all gone. This room will be empty, hopefully, right? We'll all be gone, all right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be others during the tribulation who aren't saved. There will be uh, others that are saved. I won't go into all the details. You can ask me. You've got questions about it. Ask me later. But uh, there will be those saved during the tribulation period. But that won't be a time of rest. There, except for spiritually, there won't be any rest for them until the second advent. So the rest that we're waiting for for you and I, it can come at the rapture, but for all the believers, that doesn't happen until after the tribulation period, all right? So anyway, the Greek word that's used here is a common word um, for those, a rest from those who trouble them, the idea of that person or that trouble. is a common word for trials or for tribulation that you find in the New Testament, and we're going to rest from that. We won't be going through anything that we're going through now, all right? The final eternal state for the unbeliever will be one of everlasting destruction. And we don't think in those terms because um, if I wanted to destroy something, let's say I want to destroy this, you know, destroy this chair. Well, I destroy it and we're done. It's destroyed. There's a beginning to my destruction and an end to my destruction and it's done. But for everlasting destruction, there is no end. All right? So what does that mean? That means that when a person dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, and their soul goes to hell to be destroyed forever. And I can't explain that except to say it would be like stepping through death's door except you don't go all the way through. You're in the middle, and you're in that state of being destroyed forever. Now, frankly, I prefer, you know, everlasting life, you know, where I'm in that state of enjoying life forever. But uh, that is the phraseology that the Bible uses. And this destruction, um, it says, to be destroyed, did you notice, from the presence of the Lord? Anybody catch that? No? All right, from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. And so you immediately go, wait a minute, now God's omnipresent. How does that work? He's supposed to be everywhere. So you could ask, if God is everywhere, is He in hell? Now, before you jump up and beat me up, let me finish what I'm going to say, okay? The answer is, yes, as it relates to the omnipresence of God, God is omnipresent, as well as omniscient, as well as omnipotent. Therefore, he is present there. He knows what's going on there. He has control and knowledge of it, but of course, he is not tormented by it, okay? Um, because he has power over it. He created it, okay? Uh, so he, you know, he very clearly can see and knows what's going on in all realms of everything that he's created. And it makes your head spin. Well, then how does a lost person who is in hell, how are they separated from his presence? So just because um, God sees you doesn't necessarily mean that you can see him. All right. Um, we have that ability in a very physical sense today uh, through the keyhole. Right. Look through the keyhole of the door, and I can see you, but all you can see of me is my little, you know, people or whatever. So um, there is not the ability for one who is in hell to communicate any longer with God. They're separated from the presence of the Lord. You know, one of the first, I think it's actually the first time that that phrase is used. Does anybody know where someone is separated from the presence of the Lord? You'd have to go all the way back to. Where? No, even before that. Yeah, it's in Genesis. Are you talking about Adam? No, not Adam. Where the phrase is used. What? It's in Genesis chapter 4. Cain. Cain. It says he went out from the presence of the Lord. In other words, he and God weren't talking anymore. Okay? So that's the idea there. So as it relates to those who are in hell, God's presence is not available to them. He is not present to bless them, to deal with them, to hear their prayers, or even grant common grace or light, which he can grant to us now. 
which explains, you know, the, the terrifying sense of Matthew 25, 41. Horrible explanation there. The external result of a spiritual separation that occurs even now when sin is present in our life. Someone read Isaiah 59.2. Whoever gets there, read that. Isaiah 59.2. This is like the Bible. But your one iniquities yeah. have separated between you and your God. Hey, man. And your Caleb sins won. have hid his face from you and that he will not hear. All right. So your, iniqu iniqu <laughs> your iniquities have separated you from God. Yeah, you're still a child of God. He still loves you. You're his son. But because of your sin, you're not talking. The only thing God is listening for is for you to say, I'm sorry. That's what he's listening for. After that, fellowship can be restored and everything goes on. You are still a child of God, but you're separated by your sin. All right? So, any questions on that passage before we move on? Okay, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is a very lengthy section, and it's one of the more well-known sections on the Antichrist, and there is some uh, very pointed uh, instruction given there, and I'll just kind of read through this. And it says this, um, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. And the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So it's uh, 12 verses long, and the passage begins in the first two verses with an exhortation to confidence. See, he's trying to give them a little confidence. Apparently... There had been some misconceptions concerning future events, and probably uh, from the way he says it, it sounds like uh, maybe somebody wrote some letters or something to them and had forged Paul's signature, if you will. And he said, you know, don't worry about that as, you know, as letters as from us. And so a lot of Bible scholars think that possibly a forged letter had been circulated, and this had led to confusion. And this is what happens when you have the teachings of men versus the truth of God. Uh, it will lead to confusion. The subject is given to us in verse 2, the day of Christ. Apparently, they thought that that day, the day of Christ, had already come or else uh, would come very shortly. In order to understand what is meant by the phrase, then we need to examine the usage of the day of Christ in the New Testament. I think we went through this before, didn't we? I believe we did, right? Okay, so uh, I'll just throw out a couple of verses and um, we'll kind of talk about that and move on as quickly as we can here. But in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, we find being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So according to that verse, God has begun a work in me and he will continue to perform that work until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, um, someday the rapture is going to happen. The work that he's begun in me at that point will be completed. If I die, that work which he has begun in me will not be completed until the rapture because I still won't have my glorified body. Does anybody follow? All right? Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10, just a few verses later, he says that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. So the state in which I'm supposed to be in now as a believer 
is the state of being without offense. All right? So we're talking about sanctification here. We're talking about leading a holy life or walking uprightly before God. So from Philippians 1, 6 and 10, the day of Christ is the consummation of a time period during which we are to be sincere and without offense. All right? During this time, the Lord will be working on us, thankfully. He has begun a good work and will continue it until then. That's important. Because if you're saved, and then you wonder, I know I really got saved, but it just seems the way I've been living lately that I'm no longer saved. That kind of goes against these verses. Because he's begun a good work in you, and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's look at another passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. And feel free to jump in with questions or comments anytime you want. Okay, okay. Uh, Sir? So those who are, are born, uh, born again during the millennial situation, when will that happen to them? Probably immediately, though I have nothing to hand That's, kind of, that's kind of amazing. Logic tells me that that will be an immediate thing, but I have nothing that to hang really that on. That is really getting saved. <laughs> yeah. I've got nothing to hang that on, okay? That would be an interesting study. Any others? 1 Corinthians 1, 8. Who shall also confirm you unto, unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the day of Christ, is described here as being the end, and we being confirmed unto the end. So the end result of Christ's work is the consummate or the confirmation of the believer in holiness. Christ does that, not the church. I know that there are churches that believe in confirmation, but this is not what that's talking about, okay? Uh, in holiness, and that can only be brought by the Lord. You can't be holy in yourself, all right? So it has to be done by the Lord, and that's going to happen at the end, as it's described here, uh, to be preserved blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Philippians 2.16, let's go back to Philippians now, chapter 2, verse 16, and it says, Philippians 2.16 I have my wife take a picture. I got a smile. I'm preachy. <laughs> okay. Right. Did you get it? Another one? No? Okay. <laughs> Philippians 2.16. Holding forth the word of life, the gospel, the scriptures, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Philippians 2.16 leads me to believe that it is not a day to be feared by the saint, but a day during which we may rejoice. And he's tying that rejoicing to the Philippian believers here. Um, but, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, there's something about that day that could trouble the believer. Notice this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. When you think about having to stand before the Lord and answering for your life, all will stand before him. The believer's judgment happens for the believers. The unbeliever's judgment happens for the unbelievers. The unbeliever's judgment has nothing to do with weighing their works. If you're good or bad, you get to go to heaven or hell. It's nothing like that. But they are judged according to their works. Well, so are we. But our works built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive rewards for that. Our works, which are not built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they are consumed, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, yet so is by fire, burned away, the wooden hay and stubble is gone, we get nothing for that. So it's entirely possible, though I hope it's not going to happen, but it's entirely possible that we can stand before the Lord, we'll be saved, but we have nothing to show for it. That's entirely possible. So going back to the believer's judgment, Right now, and don't answer this, but I want you to think in your own mind and in your own heart. Right now, at this present moment, would you be comfortable with having to answer for your life at this present second? Because a lot of people might not be. There are Christians that are out of the will of God. Could be some of us in here, out of the will of God. If you're out of the will of God, you really don't want the rapture to happen right now. We say we do, but we don't. We kind of like, you know like to wait a couple of minutes so we can get things squared away before it happens, but that's just not the way it's going to work. So there is an aspect to the day of Christ which can trouble the saint. What is it about the day that can trouble us? Possibly 
As we saw in the first epistle, the thought that some would not fare so well during that day. Not fare so well. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 says it this way. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So it's all not going to be roses and smiley faces. All right? There will be those believers who will have to answer for their works that they have done, which are not built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they're not going to be punished for that because the punishment was taken at Calvary. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't want to spend eternity with nothing. You know? Yo, Manasseh, I see you got 15 crowns. Well, here's my little keychain. You know, I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I don't want that to be me, you know? So... Possibly there could have been an understanding that the day of Christ would usher in the tribulation and maybe they were thinking that they were going through it at the time. I don't know because it's not specific enough for us to know. But it seems that most likely because he begins in a discussion of the Antichrist right after this. So he says, look, don't be troubled about the day of Christ being at hand. However, let me tell you about the Antichrist. So he goes into a discussion of that. And according to verse 3, first, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he says... Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So according to verse 3, there will be a falling away first, and seemingly, at the same time, the Antichrist will be revealed. So the implication is that the day of Christ will not come until this happens. What we're living in now, and I believe we're living in the last days, and I, I, I got to tell you, I've been a Christian for 36 years and uh, when I first got saved, I thought it couldn't get any worse. And it did. Much worse. And I thought it couldn't get any worse in churches. And it certainly has. And to be quite honest with you, when I go back to the States and I'm traveling around and my wife and I are trying to find a good church to attend wherever we are or whatever town we're in, it is becoming increasingly more difficult to find a good place to worship. It's almost impossible to go to an area and be there for one weekend and hope that you find a good one. You can look it up in the, in the, you know, the yellow pages. Some people still do that, by the way. Or look it up on the internet, and you can find one. You know, Billy Bob's Baptist Church. And you say, well, okay, Billy Bob's Baptist Church. It's about five miles away. Let's try that. And you're only there for one weekend. You go to Billy Bob's Baptist Church only to find out that it is about as lukewarm as it can get. And you'll wonder what's going on. Well, I'll tell you what's going on. The falling away is going on. It's happening. But remember what I said, that the falling, of the way, the falling away and the, the son of perdition coming into uh, prominence happens at the same time. Let's not fool ourselves. It's not going to be everything's going well, rapture happens, suddenly the Antichrist pops up. If the rapture were going to happen tomorrow morning, then the Antichrist, whoever he may be, would have to already be in an area of prominence today. Does everybody understand the logic? So we need to understand whenever the rapture happens, the Antichrist is already going to be on the scene. We might not know who he is, but he's already going to be in power somewhere. We just don't know him. If you knew who the Antichrist was going to be, what would you do? Defend yourself against them. I, I, I would tell you. Huh? I would tell the preacher. You tell me, great, thanks. Yeah, you got to do something about it. It's on you now. Uh, you know, I've heard some Christians say, well, I know what I'd do. I'd go assassinate the God. <laughs> it's not possible. Let me read the prophecy. That's not going to happen, okay? It's not going to occur. So um, keep that in mind that we're going through a falling away now. And if we really believe that the rapture could happen at any moment, Consequently, we also have to believe that somewhere on the world stage, the Antichrist is already making his entrance. We just don't know who he is yet, that's all. All right? So those two seem to go together. You say, well, I don't really believe that anybody I know in politics is the Antichrist. Well, then, okay, then that means that you've got time to wait. The rapture must not be happening soon. Okay? So it could be happening, and we have to keep that in mind. Paul has in mind a specific apostasy. In the history of the church, going back to the first century, there have been periods of apostasy. Periods of time when things have cooled off, and then God has brought revival, and 
you know, stirred things back up again, and that sort of thing has happened in history. But this is not some general, you know, period of apostasy, but this is a specific period that he points to that will be marked worse, okay, than what we've seen thus far. The general teaching of today's prophecy experts is that the Antichrist will not be revealed until after the rapture. But read verse 3. Verse 3 says, and I'm going to read it again, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Yes, sir? What verse was that? That was uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The general teaching is that we will not know him until after the rapture. Understand the word reveal there is the idea of a veil being taken away. So now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. There'll be no question. We'll see clearly. We'll know exactly who he is in that day. But right now we don't know. It, it could be it could be President uh, President Trump. It could be President Elect Biden. Uh, it could be uh, Kim Dae Jung. It could I don't know. Is he still living? No. Is he gone? He's gone now, right? Okay. I, well, well, it won't be him then. It could be anybody that's a you know a prominent person. Could be the Pope. Could be anybody. I don't know who it's going to be. All I can say is that um, he's waiting in the wings. All right, and the time is uh, is coming. So, um, how do we harmonize this difficulty? It's pretty simple. The Antichrist is in a position to take over, even though we don't know with certainty who he is. Okay. The remainder of the passage now will describe not only his activities, but also his destruction. So we should not think that everything will occur with him uh, must happen before the day of Christ. That's not the point. Okay? In actuality, it would make sense to have someone... Let me say it this way. It wouldn't make sense to have someone to rise from obscurity... Um, to world dominance. So we're talking world dominance here, a world leader over everything. That's not going to happen in a day. All right? So uh, there are some things that will be put in order uh, for that to happen. And I think the point should be made that although we see great apostasy happening today, complete apostasy cannot happen until true believers are removed. If the last good church on planet Earth is the haven, Apostasy cannot happen until we're gone. True, worldwide, complete apostasy. All right? So keep that in mind. As long as there are good, faithful believers around, it hasn't happened yet. All right? So that's the point. Um, but, you know, we will be gone. And then when that happens, complete apostasy will come. And that will definitely be ushering in the day of Christ. So for this very reason... We must be careful not to equate the day of Christ with the rapture. We can't equate those two terms, all right? We often do in our speaking and our general thinking, but in uh, theology proper, uh, we shouldn't do that because if we take a closer look at, uh, you know, the passages that we've already mentioned, we're going to find that they all point to rewards, the day of Christ pointing to rewards, a time of rewards. That doesn't happen until after the rapture, technically speaking, the rapture and the, the time of rewards are not the exact same time. One precedes the other. So to understand the flow of events, we could consider how they'll unfold with respect to time and place. Okay? And we'll come back to that thought next week. Any questions or comments on that? Good. So we'll stop here and we'll close in prayer. Where are we at now? And we're still in the same passage. We still got half of it to go through. Okay? So with that, Brother Manasseh, would you close us in prayer? And you can go ahead and pray the half part that I cut off, okay? Okay. Go ahead and do that. <laughs>